Matthew Knox has. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, uh, I have a California envy for the sky that is right behind you, which is gorgeous and amazing. <laughs> it's like you're having a nice weather. It's getting uh, better these days, I guess. Yeah, very nice. Okay. Looking for, it's a pity we're not allowed outside to enjoy it. So much. <laughs> Wonderful. Andrew, so why don't we get started by um, you sharing with us a little bit of your your trajectory, your your institutional context. Where are you, and um, and uh, the type of students that you that you're working with, and the work you're doing. I teach um, courses at a professional high school, which is uh, what we would call a polytechnic. We offer up to bachelor level in a variety of courses. You'll have heard from some of the others you've interviewed. There's a very large nursing school, a very large educational school, and our school is uh, technology and business. And in the technology department, I am in the energy and environment department of that. We have about 25 teachers, and we're running about 10 courses uh, between energy technology, energy management, automation engineering, robotics, all those sort of topics. And, uh, Mostly STEM, uh, science, technology, and science. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, where are you located at, uh, Andrew? We're located in Aalborg, which is in the northern part of Denmark in North Jutland. It's oh, quite right. remote. Yeah, it's a, a it's a very remote capital. So, uh, we are a regional capital, I suppose, a state capital, and um, the state is a very poor one compared to the others that are around. So. You can imagine our, our situation. We don't get the infrastructure spending that other other states uh -huh. do. So you know, uh -huh, uh -huh. a little bit perhaps uh, more industrial in its vibe than uh, than Copenhagen or some of the other big European cities. I see. So I'm I'm listening to some chimes and bells behind you. Uh, I can't. I'm not sure if you can see. That's the Bedolfi Cathedral there. That's the oh. centre of town. We live just on the same block as the main cathedral. Yeah, and that's the Glockenspiel, which runs every hour. Oh, that is that is wonderful. <laughs> so, for what I'm hearing, Andrew, your your student base will be um, a working class um, and professional sort of uh, families. Yeah, we have a predominance of uh, plumbers, uh, electricians uh -huh. uh, coming through our department to learn. Uh, various niche aspects of that industry, whether it be to do with uh, uh, an elective we're running at the moment is um, sort of renewable energy installer. And it gives you a certificate that you can put solar panels up or, um, or you know, and calculate out, you know, how to install and how what's the best way to put a solar installation or a small wind or something like that on somebody's house. So I see. we're really at the, at the coalface. A lot of... Um, heat pump conversions and and a lot of um, activities such as uh, ventilation, uh, re insulation, and sort of redoing the windows, double glazing, all that sort of stuff is right in our wheelhouse for energy yeah. savings, and sustainability. Well, that's wonderful. That's that's what we all should be looking uh, towards. And <laughs> I, I, I'm not familiar with Arborg. I, I, I've never been there. I have to tell you that it was on my list of places to visit this summer, and it's not going to happen, unfortunately. Oh, of all well. places, I, could, I was going to go visit your your area. I don't That's see. It's beautiful. Of I don't see any planes uh, on your on your sky behind, so I don't think my plane is going to be landing anytime soon. Hopefully, hopefully later on. <laughs> so if I ever ever go, I will I will make sure that uh, we get together to have a beer or something. <laughs> I'm really Perfect. hopeful. It will, it, will, it will come to pass all these. Um, how large is the city, Andrew? Uh, about 150,000 inhabitants thereabouts. It's uh, growing quite rapidly, as these regional capitals tend to do. I see. Um, and is undergoing quite rapid change. So, you know, there's a lot going on in town. Uh, how many students do you have in, in your institution? About 20,000 all told, oh, wow. uh, and probably another four or 5,000 online full-time. Online, okay. So it, it 
it might sound like you, your institution was ready to cope with with the uh, with the rapid change. Why don't we talk a little bit about how the pandemic hit your area? When did you learn, and what were the measures you had to face? It's very funny, um, but obviously <laughs> we're all following it on the news in the early days, and uh, it became quite clear. Uh, what the science was saying about this uh, disease, but there was a lot of confusion and a lot of, I would say, in amongst people, uh, bewildered, uh, a bewildered expectation that things will be just carrying on. And um, we had a staff meeting, our regular Friday staff meeting, um, on, or a I can't remember exactly when it started, but it was the week before we got locked down on a Wednesday. And at that staff meeting, I raised it as a point on the agenda and said, I think we should prepare to move all of our classes online and we should start thinking about what to do because at the rate it's going next week or the week after, they're going to shut Denmark down. Hmm. And I was making a case that we should actually start planning what the students should do. We should start to make some projects that students can work on at home and, and get a little bit prepared. Uh -huh. And that was met with um, agreement and some discussion around the table and nods of yes, if that's what we should do, but actually nothing came of it. Nothing we came. didn't actually get a chance to do anything because by Wednesday, uh, everything was shut down. So ah. It was quite fast here. The government responded quite early and gave us a a half shutdown. So the small shops were open, the large department stores and large format shops were all closed, but the small boutique shops and uh, fast food outlets and everything that was small scale under, I think about um, a thousand square feet or something like that was, was fine to stay open. And everybody just went home and that wow. was that. And that was it. So what happens to your instruction then? There was little time to prepare, although for what I gather, some of you were already teaching online and maybe even you have a robust uh, system in place. Well, we do actually, we run classes uh, online. It's actually blended learning, but the students only get a few days at the institution per semester. So. By and large, it's sort of 95% online and 5% uh, in class. I see. Um, and of course, all of my teaching is both in that online and in uh, class. And so I was eminently prepared to shift courses that I was doing both online and in class yeah. into the online mode. So for me, it was a very simple preparation. In fact, it's been very, very comfortable because I have had the courses all prepared. Huh. For me, it was a simple cut and paste operation and I was ready to go. Um, I've just started teaching an elective today and it was less than an hour to go from zero to have the whole course up and running. It opened this oh. morning, no problem. I promise I won't tell my colleagues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't know. Well, actually, <laughs> actually, you should because I think it's uh, almost a high crime that teachers are not taught how to yeah. uh, teach uh, using the full affordances of all of the ICT that's available to us. I think it's absolutely crazy. And it's a lot of really old nonsense wife tales. Now, I've published a book on how teachers can move from teaching class to teaching online. Uh -huh. It was published by Orbook University Press last year. Okay. And it has a step-by-step -step, uh, sort of indication as I'll send you the link. Yes, yes, please. Uh, as how to plan the courses and, and exactly all the research behind it. Um, and and so for me, it was a really, it's been a holiday really because wow. um, all that's been deleted is my uh, my requirement to actually go to work and be there for many hours and I just put everything online. Uh -huh. Now, when I say I put everything online, I don't mean I've got videos of me teaching. That's just nonsense. That's not what teaching online is all about. No talking here and, as the only resource, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, look, all of the research generally points to one direction, 
that that what the tools that you use in any lesson don't have much uh, bearing on the learning outcomes. Rather, it's got to do with an overall lesson plan and an arch of trying to establish learning goals and getting to those learning goals. Mm -hmm. And how you do that uh, can be successful. So field trips are a successful way to do that. Classroom lectures are a, a successful way to do that. But uh, so is setting assignments online and quizzes and getting the people, uh, getting your students to do active work in an online space. Uh -huh. And I create discussion forums and things like that and uh, places for them to share group activities, the whole nine yards. I, I do it all uh, in a virtual space and it's all asynchronous. So I don't have to bother trying to get the kids together. Uh, in one mm -hmm. place and try and speak to them all it's just such a hassle to get these these messaging systems and i i speak to a lot of my colleagues like like lorna and they they're, they're trying to put trying to piece together how do i get this lecture into this online space and they take a lot of responsibility they feel a lot of fear about having to record themselves put mm -hmm. themselves out there make a video and it never sounds as good as you want, never looks as good as you want. It's not edited very nicely. And so the whole thing becomes very daunting and there's a, there's a huge resistance to go that path. And therefore you shouldn't. If you're intimidated by recording something alone, then don't. You don't need to. It doesn't <laughs> enhance your lesson at all. You know, it's a really crazy thing. You know. Yeah, yeah. But you're right. There's, there's, uh, there hasn't been enough. I don't think we haven't used. I mean, I live in California, which is the cradle of uh, many of the technologies that we use across the world, and we are not, uh, by far, we're not uh, embedded in, in, a, in, in a pedagogical approach to the use of these tools. It's, it's actually quite casually enforced at times. Uh, at least it feels like that. Isn't that interesting? Well. Uh yeah, and I think, uh, you know, my wife is involved in the educational research. She's uh, a professor of techno-anthropology and uh, teaching online, teaching technology. And and so, you know, we were perhaps a little bit closer to this topic than, than other f families and other households. But it seems to me um, as if a lot of the actual research that's being done by her and her colleagues and, and teams all throughout the world on uh, teaching in the digital space, so there's excellent resources out there. It's well understood what needs to be done. There are some excellent resources uh, to get together, but there's almost no teacher training in it, um, mm. whether at tertiary or at, at the, I, I mean, I can only speak for tertiary level. I don't know what's going on in the actual schools, but, yeah. You know, it's it's just a travesty that there's so much work going on and teachers just don't professionally keep up with, with their profession. Yeah. Once once a teacher comes out of, of teaching college, it's just about all done. And, and you know, doctors are, are forced to go to conferences and, and forced to redo and keep up to date with bulletins and, and that is sadly lacking in the education because it's not seen as a profession like medical doctors. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not held in that high regard. People don't, don't care to rise to the top of their field. There aren't the same incentives in place. I mean, it's really a strange, yeah, yeah. it's really a strange situation. And, um, and mm -hmm. as, a, as a consequence, we all suffer. So because the work's you, been done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's, I'm assuming that the, our, our colleagues, the ones that are a little bit more reticent about embracing technology, um, there are which is 85% uh, of them, according yeah, to research. But, yeah, so I, I it's nearly that, all. I want to think that not all of them are, are resisting just because they don't want to do the work. Some, some of them would, would talk about how important it is to have the, the, the presence of the classroom, the interaction of the classroom. Students will consistently report these days because we're also conducting interviews with students. But the one thing that they miss the most is is that interaction in the classroom. It seems like we are we have evolved as a species to to have that level of interaction. So how do you feel about um, the way the the digital tools that we use, the way they help us or or stop us from having that level of interaction? I think um, to be honest with you, the this this is a Tri tired old argument about classroom interactions uh -huh. 
but you know much of pedagogy is trying to create enough atmosphere in the class that students can actually do work you know not a large part of a teacher's day is trying to reduce the number of interactions going on in the class and it causes stress There's strict rules and regulations it's a very hierarchical environment the teacher has a lot of power mm -hmm. over the students mm -hmm. i mean and, and so this is it's a it's a nonsense to to think that that the um, this interaction has such an important role to play in actually being at school. If that was the case, then schools would look very different. Mm. Now, our school, for example, is a big building full of white boxes with whiteboards at the front and plain office-style seating with no posters on the wall, nothing. I mean, it's the coldest, most uninspiring environment you could ever think of. And, and we think that putting students in there is a stimulating environment. They're going to learn stuff. It's just... It just goes against every piece of research on education that I've ever heard of. It's just not stimulating. It's not a very good environment. And the environment itself is, does not lend itself to this interaction. Um, and I think you, if you look to the modern workspaces like the, you know, the Googleplex and you see multifunctional rooms and areas where people can break off and do work and quiet zones and active zones and that's how schools and if you want interaction, that's how it should be arranged. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But you know, and, and this is this is 20, 30 years old stuff. You know, you yeah. don't need to go far in the literature to find out that that's all been done. Well, but we schools know. are not built on this basis very often. Uh, yeah. I mean, you do get some, you know, some schools are, but most of them are built on an economic thing. You get as many rooms as possible, Absolutely. stuff them full as many bums as possible, as short as possible, and get them out the door. Well, institutions are slow to learn yeah. and, and you know and the survival of the institution sometimes is is what drives the decisions and and yeah. that's not always the most rational of, of ways of making decisions so you know this really leads nicely into an aspect that i'm i'm really interested in in getting perspectives and and i might i might want to hear what you have to say about it. most most folks that i've talked to see opportunity in this uh, crisis in this situation in that uh, we've been asked to do what we probably should have been asked to do a long time ago. And it's an opportunity to rethink and retool what we're doing. So if it was solely in your power, uh, Andrew, what kind of a scenario you would go back to gladly in terms of your institution? Um, what scenario would I go back to in terms of how it was or how do I see no. the future? What, what, what's see, the shape of the question? How do you see the future, yes. Well, um, if I had the power to change the way the institution operates, I would stop. At the moment, our institution is suffering uh, with a constrained budget and has recently gone around uh, uh, making redundancies and things like that and cutting staff. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think this is a, a stupidity because, of course, the teaching load doesn't increase unless decrease unless you get rid of students, and uh, and of course with a tighter staff the administrative load becomes higher. I mean everything just starts to wear you down, and the ad attitude at work has changed. Everybody's mm -hmm. feeling stressed. We have people off on sick leave because they are stressed, um, and then you add COVID on top. Yeah. There are two things. One, I I don't make predictions about the future. Um, based on what's seen in the past. But a couple of things give me uh, some really optimism. One is I like the sound of the discussions that are being had now that this old, tired, old excuse of we have to have the students in class to make things happen is now blown out of the water. The students can't be in class. Things are still happening. Exams will still get passed. That old hobby horse is dead. And it's been proven that mm -hmm. it can be done. Mm -hmm. And maybe we don't go for a hundred percent of the students in a school, but maybe we go for a mix of 50 50 mix of half of the students' uh, time is spent at school, yeah. and the other half of the time is spent away from school or mm -hmm. in a less structured environment where they can do work online. Mm -hmm. And um, And then your requirement for buildings and all that is severely cut. Now, our, our institution wouldn't have to um, get rid of staff if it could get rid of a campus. 
and <laughs> keep the same number of students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a discussion now that, that I've been saying this in our institution for the, the whole time I've worked there for, for the last four years. And now it looks fairly prophetic that we could take this online stuff and blend it in a 50-50, 60-40 kind of blend and have a really top quality result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our school follows this sort of uh, project-based learning. So the students are asked to do a rather large project each semester anyway. So that's really good. They work on their own and they can, you know, they're, they're, they're autonomous in that regard for a large part. And we can really enhance that and lift it to the next level, I think, without too much suffering. And we could save a lot on buildings. On buildings, yeah. But um, it seems to me as if much management is concerned about how grandiose things look as to how they actually function. So that's going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's correct. I'm, I'm thinking back. But I mean, encouraged yeah, by, the, by the conversations that are being had. The conversations are improving, like the one we're having. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I think uh, that's a great opportunity that emerges from a crisis that we're forced to sit down and, and rethink what we have to do and 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 also there to um, apply some of the ideas that we've been having for a long time. And this is not new, as you were well saying. So I'm really intrigued about your writing, and I would love to get a hold on, on you. Is, is your is, uh, is your book published in, in also in English? Uh, uh, yeah, it is. It's written in English, and it's a free download. It's uh, for the published. It's paid for by the university. So oh, that is fantastic. Uh, so it's I'm, a teacher resource, so any teacher can get it for free. I will make sure to, uh, as, as you probably yeah. know, I have uh, this series of clips posted on a YouTube uh, channel as well. So I will make sure to set up a link underneath so that people that are interested can can access that. And I, for one, will be very interested in, in taking a look at it. So, you know, I hope you are prophetic in that um, uh, all over the world we, we move into a, a different kind of application of pedagogies. It's long overdue. And um, that's the one thing that I'm liking about this uh, situation that is forcing us to sit mm. down and rethink. All right. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for your time. I don't see any white lines on your sky again. I, I wish there was a little more so that my plane would be flying there. I'd love to have an opportunity one day to stop by and, and say hello in person. Uh, oh, it's nice to see you in camera, but uh, also the uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also um, happy with thinking that physical proximity is not going anywhere. <laughs> so, all right. Andrew, thank you for your time. It's such a pleasure. No problem. I'll uh, I'll send you a link by email today. So. Have wonderful. a great day at work.